Most religions talk about a realm beyond the natural world, a supernatural realm filled with supernatural persons. These persons have desires and loyalties and other human psychological qualities. In the case of traditional Christianity, the supernatural beings include angels and demons, human souls, and God in three persons, the Blessed Trinity. But what is a person? A few years back, my daughter Bryn, then in the sixth grade, wrote an impassioned essay arguing for the personhood of chickens. Chickens should be considered persons, she said, because they are conscious with feelings and preferences and intentions. They experience pleasure and pain. They know what they like. They have distinct personalities. She was arguing that they should be treated kindly and not have their beaks cut off. Arthur de Adamo's book, Science Without Bounds, considers an entirely different type of question from chicken welfare. Ontology, the nature of reality. His book explores ontologies that have identified the ultimate reality, in other words, God, as a person, and contrasts them with those that have not. His treatment is deep and nuanced, and I recommend it. But his starting definition of personhood is remarkably similar to Brin's. It includes awareness, intellect, and emotion. The personhood of God, Adamo argues, is at the heart of Abrahamic theism, including Christian belief and practice. Even when believers say that they believe in the more abstract God of theologians, most don't, at least not completely, in their day-to-day -day lives and in a laboratory setting, they talk and behave as if they were relating to a God who is a human-like person. For example, students who say that God is outside of time will still analyze a story as if he completes one task and then moves on to another. Also, our brains naturally incline toward interpreting physical stimuli like rocks, ships, stuffed animals, or clouds in anthropomorphic terms, and gods are no exception. When we are children, one of the ways that we acquire independence from our flesh and blood parents is by creating virtual copies of them in our minds. Psychologists call these introjected parents. There are developmental advantages to this. When you can hear mom in your head saying, don't cross the street alone, honey, then you don't need her hovering over you, lest you step a careless foot off the sidewalk. The virtual mom takes over the work of the real world mom. The downside, of course, is that we often spend years of adulthood trying to get our parents' voices out of our heads. But without this ability to have a relationship with a virtual authority figure, children would be stuck. There's a natural flow from an interjected earthly father to a heavenly father. And research suggests that whether a believer's earthly father was kind or cruel, authoritarian or affectionate, helps to define the personality of his God. Christian apologists, meaning defenders of the faith, use lofty, abstract words. They argue for the possibility of the existence of a highly abstracted form of God that exists beyond the realm of human reason and the reach of science. But what many want is something more specific. To create intellectual space for their belief in the person God of the Bible, they craft abstract arguments to protect faith in something more emotionally satisfying and primitive and humanoid. In this endeavor, they are similar to a wide range of religious believers. Monotheistic humans ask four basic questions about God. Does God exist? What is God like? What does God want from us? How can we get what we want from God? In reality, the first of these questions, does God exist, tends to be interesting only in the context of the other three. In other words, God is interesting only if he is knowable and has what psychologists call hedonic relevance. By hedonic relevance, I mean that by understanding or pleasing God, 
I can make my life better or worse. If God is defined at a level of abstraction sufficient to satisfy many scientists, philosophers, or modernist theologians, he becomes immediately uninteresting to most believers. Consider, for example, Albert Einstein's statements. I believe in Spinoza's God, who reveals himself in the orderly harmony of what exists, not in a God who concerns himself with the fates and actions of human beings. I cannot imagine a God who rewards and punishes the objects of his creation, whose purposes are modeled after our own. Within Christianity, Bishop John Shelby Spong takes a stab at making this vision personally relevant. He says, I do not think of God theistically, that is, as a being supernatural in power who dwells beyond the limits of my world. I would rather experience God as the source of life, willing me to live fully, the source of love, calling me to love wastefully, and, to borrow a phrase from the theologian Paul Tillich, as the ground of being, calling me to be all that I can be. Contrast this with the God of evangelical Christians. God loves me. I have a personal relationship with Jesus. If I ask from God in prayer anything, I will receive. People who die are going to heaven or hell. Understanding emotions is irrelevant to Einstein and Spinoza's God concepts because the God of Spinoza and Einstein is not a person and does not have emotions. The same is true of Spong's God. On the other hand, if one is trying to assess a more traditional or orthodox Christian view, for example, the Evangelicals' God concept, then understanding emotions is highly relevant. In fact, one of the defining attributes of the orthodox God is actually an emotion, love. Evangelicals call themselves biblical or Bible-believing Christians. Many of them are proud to claim the Bible as the literally perfect and complete Word of God. In fact, critics often say that evangelicals and other biblical literalists engage in bibliolatry or text worship. Whether right or wrong, biblical literalists like evangelicals pin their life priorities and hopes for eternity to the God concept of the Bible writers and the Bible writers thought of God as a person who not only loves but manifests a whole host of emotions. That's ridiculous, some modernist Christians might protest. It's obvious that when the Bible talks about God's emotions, it is speaking in metaphor. But for several reasons, this argument is weak. 1. Historians of religion and philosophy tell us that theology has a flow which can be studied in the historical record just like we can study the flow of evolution in the geological record. We have a tendency to project our own intellectual culture, including abstractions, like abstract God concepts, back into history. But during the axial period when the world's great religions emerged, the gods, Shiva, Zeus, Mithra, or Yahweh, were person gods. Two, if we look at the internal record of the Bible itself, Earlier documents were taken literally by later writers. The book of Matthew, for example, gives Jesus a literal understanding of the Old Testament events. 3. Literalists say that the Bible was uniquely inspired or even dictated by God to the authors. If this were the case, then claiming that God's emotions in the Bible were simply metaphors would make God a bad writer. A good writer doesn't use metaphors that he or she knows will be taken literally. Communication isn't just about transmission, it's about knowing your audience. And today, many, many Christians take the notion of God's emotions literally. So did their spiritual ancestors. So to say that God was communicating in metaphor through the Bible writers is to say that God needed communications training. For the rest of this series, then, about God's emotions, I'm going to assume that Bible-believing Christians mostly mean what they say when they use words like God loves you, or God is disgusted by homosexuality, or God is grieved by our sin. We owe it to ourselves not to play word games about life's most important questions. And barring evidence to the contrary, we owe it to other people to take their words at face value. And if we value honesty, 
integrity, and truth-seeking, we owe it to the world to ask what those words mean. <laughs>